Welcome to the April Citizens Climate Lobby call. We're really happy to have all of you on. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to welcome you if you're one of the new chapters that's joined recently. So in the US, that includes Southwest Riverside County in California, Lakeland, Florida, St. Gerald's of Michigan, Michigan, Queens, West New York, Finley, Lima, Ohio, Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, Gillette, Wyoming, University of Northern Iowa and Iowa, Frederick, Maryland, Lane County, Oregon, Akron, Cannon, Ohio, Memphis, Tennessee, and Door County in Wisconsin. Also in Canada, we added chapters in Abbotsford, British Columbia, and Dauphin, Manitoba. Outside the US and Canada, we added uh, chapters in Kampala, Uganda, Kigali, Rwanda, Santiago, Chile, and Bogota, Colombia. So welcome to all of you. It's nice to see so many new chapters joining uh, recently. I wanna to talk to the people in the US for just a moment before we get started on the call. And that is, uh, what do we do about this Congress and this moment? And here's what we think we should all be doing. Our Congress and our country is facing two gigantic, horrific challenges. One is the COVID virus and the other is um, the economic collapse. <clears throat> we believe that we should give Congress a break on climate for a little bit. We'll come back to them when the time is right. But at this particular moment, what we should be doing is allowing them to do their work, knowing that we'll be building capacity and we'll come back when the time is right. But if this moment, if we could just back off and let them deal with those two issues, we think that would be most helpful. I've had a lot of people reach out to me and ask, but what about the stimulus? Should we try and influence the shape and size of the stimulus? And what our research on the Hill and our DC office tells us is those issues are being handled by leadership. And one of the things that we don't ever wanna do is waste your time or waste Congress's time. And we just believe it won't help you and it won't help Congress for that you to ask them to do something they can't do. They don't wanna say no to you. They don't wanna be ineffectual when you make requests. So if we could let them deal with this, let the leadership take care of this, there will be time to come back on climate and you know we'll do that. Okay, so our founder, Marshall Saunders, used to uh, have one of his favorite quotes was something from Buckminster Fuller that essentially said this, the important thing to do is the thing that you see needs to be done that nobody else sees needs to be done. And that clearly is the case of our guest today, Nathaniel Stinnett. So one of the things that he noticed was that people who had a big concern for the environment, for climate, don't necessarily show up and vote. And so you know how usually when you and I hear about things like that, we complain to people and say, you know, somebody ought to do that. And why isn't somebody handling that? Well, Nathaniel just said, okay, I'll do that. So in 2015, he started the Environmental Voter Project. We're very happy that he started the program. And we asked him if he could be on the call today to tell us what's happening and the things that we can do to help with the process. So thank you. Welcome back. It is so great to have you on the call again, Nathaniel Stinnett. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank you to the whole CCL staff who not only is making uh, this call work today, but makes everything that you guys do work, uh, work every day. And thank you to all of you for taking some time out of your day to uh, not just learn about what CCL is up to, but learn about what the Environmental Voter Project is up to. Uh, I am just, before I get started here, I'm going to just try to share my PowerPoint here. Ricky, hopefully you can tell me whether this is working the way you want it to work are you uh we can see it looks great awesome great yeah. wonderful okay uh so as you likely know i'm going to present for about 12 15 minutes and then we're going to have hopefully a really robust discussion and q a afterwards what that means is by design I'm going to skip over some stuff. I'm going to just like touch very lightly on some otherwise pretty nuanced and complex aspects of the work that we do at the Environmental Voter Project. Just know that's because I want to go into depth on what you care about, not what I feel like talking about. So if there's anything that I touch on in brief and you think, oh gosh, I'd really like more than a five second uh, discussion of what Nathaniel means about that, please, please go ahead and ask your question in the Q&A. And if we can't get to it on today's call, I'd be happy to work with Mark and the team at CCL to figure out other ways to answer your questions. Uh, with that being said, let's, let's get off to the races here. 
The Environmental Voter Project is a nonpartisan nonprofit that is laser focused on finding non-voting environmentalists and turning them into better voters. Now, what that means is there's actually a lot of stuff that we don't do that typical environmental nonprofits do do. So we don't lobby for, for particular policies. We don't endorse politicians. We don't even try to persuade people to care more about climate or the environment, as odd as that might sound. Rather, we are finding people who are already with us. We are finding people who care so deeply about climate and the environment that it is their number one priority over all other issues, yet they are not voting. And then we are trying to turn those people into better voters. A good way to think about our work is we are not in the mind changing business or the opinion changing business. Rather, we are in the behavior changing business. We think, as Mark alluded to, we think that one of the most efficient leverages of political power in the climate movement and the environmental movement right now is to find people who don't need their minds changed. They just need their behavior tweaked. And we are able to leverage the latest data science and behavioral science to find these non-voting environmentalists and turn them into more consistent voters. So I'm gonna very quickly go through why we do this, and how we do this and what we're currently doing at the Environmental Voter Project. And hopefully this will not just educate you about our work, but also inform some of the great work that you guys are doing every day at Citizens Climate Lobby. Because I know that you understand, much like we do at the Environmental Voter Project, that uh, a dramatic increase in political power is, is absolutely necessary for getting environmental leadership. So let's get started and talk about the problem we're trying to address. One of the biggest reasons we're not getting environmental leadership in the United States right now is when you look at polls of likely voters, this is the kind of data you see. So right now, th this is looking at the 2016 presidential election. When we polled likely voters in 2016, only 2% listed climate or the environment as their top priority and another 2% listed it as their number two priority. My guess is that many of you were frustrated like I was that climate change didn't come up once. And in the marketplace. And when politicians look at the political marketplace, care about and what voters prioritize, these are the numbers they see. Now let's go ahead to 2018. This is a slight apples to oranges comparison because we're talking about two different elections. But in the 2018 midterm elections, 7% of voters listed climate or the environment as their number one priority. So again, it's, it's an apples to oranges comparison, but still that's a lot of movement, a lot of movement from 2016 to 2018. If you skip ahead to 2020, well, we're, we're at a moment in time where uh, everything's been turned upside down and it's hard to figure out who is likely to vote and who isn't likely to vote because no one even knows how to hold elections anymore. But our best guess is we are now at a point where maybe 10% of likely voters list climate or the environment as their number one priority over all other issues. Let's just pause right there. That's huge growth. That is enormous growth over the last three and a half years. And we should all be very, very proud of that. However, however, when a quarter of all voters list healthcare as their number one priority, and another quarter list immigration, and 20% list economy and jobs, I mean, being in fifth or sixth place is not something we should pat ourselves on the back about. Because the truth is, the clock is ticking, and politicians pay attention to what voters deeply, deeply care about. And seven, eight, nine, ten percent ain't going to move the dial. It ain't going to move the dial. And here's why focusing on what voters care about is of such supreme importance. Campaigns only target likely voters 
or people who are fairly likely to vote. And if there is only one thing that you take away from today's presentation, let it be this. Who you vote for is secret, but whether you vote or not is public record. It's public record. And if I am running Mark Reynolds's campaign for, for governor of California, our only goal is to get 50% plus one of the vote on election day. And if it is public information, who votes and who doesn't vote, do you think Mark's gonna spend all his time talking to the people who we know for a fact don't vote? No way, no way in hell. And so do you think politicians are gonna spend all their time talking to people who do not vote? No, they focus on the people who they know for a fact have a history really only focus and target likely voters, well, let's think about who they are likely to poll. If they only target likely voters, they're only going to poll likely voters. And this might seem cynical, but we deal with this every day in the rest of our lives. I mean, we don't expect Ford Motor Company to ask three-year-olds what they think of their latest model because three-year-olds don't drive. Well, similarly, politicians really don't care about the opinions or priorities of non-voters. They only care about the relevant marketplace, the marketplace of people who are gonna decide whether they get to keep their job or not. And so those polls that I just showed you, there's nothing secret about them. Anybody can do a poll. And as all of us are sitting on this call today, there are probably a hundred polls in the field asking voters what issues they care most about. But they're not polling unregistered voters. They're not even polling registered voters who don't show up. They are only polling people who have a history, who have a public record of showing up for these elections. And right now that's bad news for the environment. It's bad news for the environment because of those polls I showed to you. When you poll likely voters or people who actually vote, very, very few of them list climate or the environment as their top priority. Now that number's growing. And again, we should be very proud of that. But that lack of demand in the marketplace has an enormous impact. Because let's say when I'm running Mark's campaign for governor, he actually gets elected. Well, what's he gonna spend his political capital on? Is he gonna spend his precious political capital on something that voters don't give a darn about? No, that's enormously hard to ask politicians to do. Now, I've thrown all this somewhat depressing <laughs> news at you. Let me show you some other interesting data that hopefully will, will lead us towards a more optimistic place because by the end of this in six or seven minutes, hopefully you will be very excited and feeling very empowered. It turns out the reason so few voters care deeply about the environment is not because too few Americans care about the environment. In fact, Tens of millions of Americans care so deeply about climate and the environment that it's their number one priority over all other issues. So why isn't that showing up in these polls? Because remember, politicians only care about voters. They don't care about non-voters. And it turns out that most environmentalists don't vote. They don't vote. And yes, that's going to be frustrating, but I also suggest to you that that's an enormous opportunity for the climate movement because it's really hard to get someone to change their mind about climate change. And it's a lot easier to get them to change their behavior and show up and vote on election day. So very quickly, let me define this problem. In 2014, 44% of registered voters voted in the midterm election. Only 21% of environmentalists did. In the 2016 presidential election, 69% of registered voters showed up to vote, but only 50% of environmentalists did. In 2018, it was a lot better, had the highest turnout of any midterm election since World War I. 57% of registered voters voted. And 53% of environmentalists showed up. Yay, we did a lot better. But we're still not even average. We're still not even average. And believe me, there are some issue constituency groups in this country who vote like it's their job. You talk to someone who views gun rights as their top priority, they vote all the time. They vote for library trustee. They vote for city council. They vote for everything. 
and I'm not claiming that, that environmentalists are different from gun owners. They, they're, there's absolutely overlap. I'm just using it as an example that some people vote all the time and environmentalists are struggling to just hit average. This is a big problem. And to use raw numbers, 15.8 million already registered to vote environmentalists skipped the 2014 midterms. 10 million skipped the 2016 presidential election, and we think as many as 14 million have never voted before right now. So as many as 14 million heading into the upcoming presidential election have never voted. Okay, I've spent a lot of time defining the problem. I'm gonna quickly get through what EVP, the Environmental Voter Project is doing so that we can get to questions and answers. What we do at the Environmental Voter Project is essentially just three things. The first is identification. We use these public voter files and all the data that's on them, and then we work with data scientists to build these models that help us identify on an individual basis who all these non-voting environmentalists are. And I'm happy to go through this in more detail if people have questions about it in the, in the Q&A, but we essentially use the same tools that insurance companies do when they build actuarial tables. We get all of this data and we put it through the meat grinder and it helps us predict with a frightening degree of accuracy who the environmentalists are and who the ones who, who, who don't care about the environment are. Then we run a full-time field campaign. We have over 3,000 volunteers around the country who are texting, calling, mailing, sending digital ads, and, and canvassing uh, when there's not a pandemic going on, uh, talking to these voters, turning them into more consistent voters whenever there's an election. I wanna be clear about that. The Environmental Voter Project is not an election winning group. We are an electorate changing group. And so we go into states that have really large populations of non-voting environmentalists, and whenever they have an election, even if it's for library trustee or city council, we use that as an intervention opportunity to turn non-voters into voters. Because voting is a habit, just like eating healthy or exercising is a habit. And you can't change someone's habits by only talking to them every two or four years when there's a big sexy election. You need to talk to them all the time. And so every single day, we're working to turn these, these, these infrequent voters into good voters. Just today, just this Saturday, we're probably gonna text and call 50,000 non-voting environmentalists around the country. And then finally, habit reinforcement. We stay with these people until they become such good voters that we know politicians are gonna target them. We know campaigns are going to target them. How do we do it? Well, as I mentioned, we canvass when, when it is safe to do so. Uh, we call, we text, we send direct mail, we send digital ads, we never endorse. And here's the really interesting thing. Because we know that these people are already with us, because we know that if you shake them awake at night, they're gonna scream climate change, we don't need to waste any time with issue education. We don't need to waste any time with persuading them to care about the climate or the environment. All we need to do is nudge their behavior. And this allows us to take advantage of the latest behavioral science and use completely politically agnostic messaging. We will contact people and just say, hey, Mark, did you know last time there was an election, 83 people on your block of Main Street turned out to vote? Very basic peer pressure. We'll also take advantage of widely held societal norms, like most people wanna be thought of as honest promise keepers. So we'll text these non-voting environmentalists and we'll say, hey, uh, Ricky, do you intend to vote on November 3rd? Oh, great. And then we'll follow up with Ricky again right before the election. And instead of having to convince him of the importance of his one vote, which is hard, we can have a very different conversation, a very powerful conversation that instead takes advantage of his desire to be an honest person. We can say, hey, Ricky, I just wanted to remind you on April 11th, you made a promise that you were gonna vote. And we know it's important to you to keep your promises. Oh boy, does that work better. And then very quickly, our results in the 2018 midterm elections, using this behavioral science, completely apolitical approach, we were able to prove in our randomized control trials that out of the 2.1 million voters we contacted, we were solely responsible in six states for adding almost 59,000 brand new voters to the electorate. 
Then last year, we expanded from the six states that you see there into an additional six states. So now we are in these 12 states. And again, even in 2019, we contacted these non-voting environmentalists for over 600 local and state elections. And we do this for two reasons. One, local and state policymaking is important. I don't need to tell a bunch of policy wonks like you that mayors can save the planet. But two, the way you change habits is to use every election as an opportunity to turn non-voters into voters. And then finally, we ended up doing, making all these voter contacts last year. This year, in 2020, we contacted almost 4 million voters for presidential primaries and caucuses, and we're still going. We're gonna be targeting 5 million non-voting environmentalists in these 12 states over the summer. And our universe shrinks for the presidential election, because again, we only talk to people who are unlikely to vote, and lots of people are likely to vote in a presidential general, but unlikely to vote in a state primary. So our target universe gets a little bit smaller. But still, in our 12 states, there are 2.5 million already registered environmentalists who have never, ever voted before. And we know them. We, we literally know them by name and street address. And we've got thousands of volunteers texting and calling them, leveraging the latest behavioral science, not to persuade them of anything other than the importance of voting. I'm going to very quickly finish now three things that you guys can all do at home. One, pledge to vote. You can go to our website, environmentalvoter.org, and sign our voter pledge, and we will send you election reminders whenever you have an election. Two, volunteer. Volunteer for CCL. Volunteer for the Environmental Voter Project. Get involved. And finally, and hopefully I'll get into some of the behavioral science we use during our Q&A session, be a loud and proud environmental voter. Decades of behavioral psychology and behavioral economics research shows that human beings are societal animals more than we are rational animals. And the, the greatest power you have to change what your neighbors and your friends and your peers do is in letting them know the way you express yourself as an environmentalist is by voting. All of us take our cues of how to act from looking at other people whom we know and trust. And so you need to be loud and proud about the fact that voting, voting is the highest form of being an environmentalist right now. I'm gonna close because I fear I've gone a little bit over by just saying this. One, thank you. Thank you for all the work that all of you do on a regular basis. Two, do not be discouraged under no circumstances are you allowed to leave this presentation and say, oh, this Nathaniel Stinnett guy said environmentalists don't vote. Oh, this is such an awful thing. No, this is outstanding news. It's outstanding news. What would be bad news is if I told you, hey, we've done all this polling and no one cares about climate change. That would be a disaster. <laughs> but that's not what we see. We see that actually record numbers of Americans list climate change as their number one priority. They're just not voting. And as frustrating as that might be, that is an enormous opportunity because changing people's minds is so hard. But changing their behavior, I won't claim it's easy, it's not, but it's a heck of a lot easier. And so the fact that there are literally 10 to 15 million already registered super environmentalists who are just there waiting for us, oh man, I, I mean, it, that is an enormous opportunity for the climate movement. And then the final thing I'll just close in saying is 206 days from now, we're all going to be sitting down on our couches to watch election returns roll in. And, and, I, and I know I just made a whole bunch of you feel sick to your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> don't have any regrets. Do your future self a favor and don't have any regrets you're not gonna get the next 206 days back. So please dedicate yourself to what CCL's goals are, to what the Environmental Voter Project's goals are, and do that future self a favor and don't have any, any regrets. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And I, I still think we do have a time for a couple of questions. And Flannery, I think you've been monitoring the questions to see what the themes are, is that right? Yes, I have, thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you, Nathaniel, for such a wonderful presentation. 
Um, there are a few questions in the chat asking if you could explain a little more how is an environmentalist defined in your work? Um, people are curious about where you're gathering the data that you use, um, if that's something that other people could access. Um, and also people are wondering how you choose what states you operate in. Great, great. So I'll take the, the final question first. Uh, we are in 12 states. So uh, let me try to find one of the maps here. There we go. We are in t these 12 states. We chose those states not because of any one particular election. Believe me, talking to uh, infrequent voters is a pretty awful way to win one election. That's not our goal. Our goal is to dramatically increase the amount of political power in a particular area so that we can get more environmental leadership. And we chose these 12 states. Populations of non-voting environmentalists. We chose these states because this is where all the non-voting environmentalists are. So they offer the best opportunity for our work. Are there other important states? Yeah, of course there are. But we're in these states because they, they present the best leverage for what we do at EVP. To get to the other questions, because we do not do any issue education, because we do not do any persuasion trying to tell people that climate change is important or get them to care more about it, we define environmentalist uh, with a very high bar. We are only going after people who don't just care about climate or some other environmental issue, but rather prioritize it so much that it is their number one priority over all other issues, which is obviously a very idiosyncratic and narrow definition of environmentalists. But we think it's important, one, because there are still millions of those people out there who aren't voting. Two, these people are the most likely to shift policymaking. Politicians don't care what your fifth most important priority is. They care what your number one priority is. And three, Again, we're not doing any issue education, and so that's why we want to we wanna move these people. And then how do we define these people? Well, our first step is using publicly available voter files, and there's lots of data on these voter files. Then what we do is we contract with companies that have collected other publicly available data this is all data that's publicly available. So you subscribe to National Geographic and National Geographic, as I'm sure you all know, sells your name to lots of other organizations. And we never see this data, but there are these groups out there, groups that Democratic campaigns, Republican campaigns, nonprofits, lots of other organizations work with that have created these, these data-rich versions of the voter file. We actually never get this data. For security reasons, we don't even want it. We don't want it. But because it's there, because we have these voter files that also have all this consumer and behavioral data about people, that allows us to work with data scientists to build these predictive models where we can really, really accurately identify who these non-voting environmentalists are. And I, don't, I know we don't have time for me to go into a really long-winded discussion of this, but very, very quickly, we will poll about 15 or 20,000 people a state, isolate the ones who list climate or the environment as their top priority, try to see what data they have in common with each other, and, and we look for different groupings, and then essentially build an actuarial table the same way a life insurance company would. But whereas life insurance companies are trying to figure out how long you're going to live, we're trying to figure out who is the most likely to list climate or the environment as their top priority. And just like life insurance companies have gotten so good at this that they can make billions of dollars, uh, nonprofits and political campaigns have gotten very good at this too. So I realize that that only scratches the surface of what we do, but I, I want to respect people's time and they can absolutely go to environmentalvoter.org to learn a little bit more about this, this process. Great. Thank you so much, Nathaniel. That was so helpful, so useful, so timely. And yes, all of us do have a pit in our stomach about the next 208 days. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank you so much. And you're welcome to stay on for the next 10 minutes if you like, but I know you've got little kids and it is, uh, it's a weekend. So thank you so much. Well, my pleasure. And thank you to all of you.
yeah, this is an amazing group of people who blow me away every every single week of the extraordinary things they do. Yeah. Uh, many of you in about 10 minutes will be joining your local groups um, meeting, which means you'll be going to a different Zoom connection. And so if you have that connection from your group leader, please be prepared to do that. As I said, just before we started the call, we are doing a virtual Earth Day on uh, April 25th at one o'clock East Coast time. There's 1,079 people who are registered for that already. We're very excited. Uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe is going to be our featured speaker, so we're very excited to her, have her back. And then we'll also be having uh, some breakout sessions. So you can see those when you actually register for Earth Day, what the breakout sessions were, and you can pick what breakout session you want to go to. Uh, so far this year, we've already had 218 meetings with members of Congress, so that's, that's a good start to the year. And, um, uh, you know, it's particularly when it hasn't been big time in districts. So thank you all for reaching out with that. Also, the op-ed that we sent out a few weeks that has been now published 26 times. So thank you for reaching out to your newspaper and getting that published. Uh, really good work by Steve Valk and Flannery Winchester. Uh, thank you, Flannery, for putting that together for us to uh, get out there. Okay, so what are we doing this month? In Canada, we're focusing on letters to the editor and uh, Canada is also doing a May virtual conference. I think this is a great time for all of us. Uh, I noticed that my personal newspaper is starting to have a little bit more appetite for anything other than just COVID or whether Trump is either the best or worst president ever. So that's, that's like all it had for weeks, it seemed like. It seems like they do have some appetite to start publishing more letters. And particularly given this is Earth Month, I think we should be able to, uh, to get a lot of pieces published. In the US, what are we doing? Well, if you look at the action sheet, the first thing it says is take care of yourself. And there's a lot of broad ways you could interpret that. So we have a lot of resources that you could take advantage of right now. So for instance, you could brush up on your social media skills, or there's a lot of trainings we have, or you could learn, we have a great recent trainings we had on how to best use Zoom. Um, but you could also take care of yourself like making sure you're getting enough sleep, uh, making sure the people around you have what they need. Um, you know, I found that the people I work with very closely are distracted more often than they used to be. Uh, almost everybody I work with has fought, forgotten something really important they needed to do. And so we need extra time to just slow down and take care of ourselves, and know that we've never had to deal with this as human beings. We've never had to deal with something this dramatic of two major crises, including the fact that you've been carrying the climate for years. So this is just one of those times where let's all look around and see what you would call taking care of yourself and find, hopefully, new or disciplined ways of doing that. <clears throat> the second thing is Earth Day. Uh, the line that we have reserved for Earth Day will hold up to 10,000 people. And we've got a little over 1,000 registered now, so please reach out to everybody. It's going to be a great event. Uh, it will be worth your while, so please use the resources that we have to um, reach out to as many people as possible and invite them to our Earth Day. And then the third thing is, there's also a link to TurboVote. So we now have a partnership with TurboVote where if you run into people who are not registered to vote, uh, obviously the first step in getting people who are concerned to vote on uh, import, an environment and climate issues is making sure they're registered to vote. So that resource is available to you now, please use it. I also recommend that you actually go through the process of using TurboVote yourself because it'll set, send you important alerts it will tell you how to get mail-in ballots if you need one. So it's a great resource just for you and I. And I think the more we understand it, the more it will be easy for us to um, get it out to other people also. Okay, then what about June? So we are, will be doing a June virtual conference. We are going to do it on June the 13th in conjunction with our June monthly call. So um, it will be designed close, except for in a much shorter version, which our previous conferences are. It'll be around a half day long. Uh, we'll have uh, plenary sessions, we'll have breakout sessions. So all the things that go with the conference, you know, educating ourselves, seeing other people, uh, those things will happen. The second part of it though is when we've always done our conferences in June, we've done it in conjunction with a um, lobby day. And so the question is, 
do we want to do a virtual lobby day, which certainly adds challenges that we've never had to face uh, when we go to DC? And the answer to that is, hell yes, we want to do a lobby day. I mean, this is CCL. We're definitely going to do a lobby day. The plan at this point is we'll do the conference on the 13th. And then on the Wednesday, Tuesday of that week, we'll, which will be the um, 16th, we'll lobby the House, the 17th, the Senate. We'll set this all up virtually. That's going to be done, set up by your local chapters. So if you want to be part of that lobby meeting, check with your group leader, check with your liaison. We're going to work with Congress to find out the easiest way that is for them to do with it. But we're definitely planning on doing that. And even on Thursday evening, the 18th, we're going to do a virtual reception. So for those of you who've been able to come to Washington, D.C. in either June and November, any of the last several years, we do a reception to celebrate working with people. And sometimes members of Congress speak, and sometimes uh, some of you who it's the first time you get a chance to lobby get a chance to speak. There's food, there's usually drinks, so we're helping you bring food and drinks. And one of the features of our lobby day is we always have vegan cupcakes. So we're all hoping that everybody brings a vegan cupcake with them uh, and that we all celebrate together on that Thursday. So <clears throat> it's gonna be tricky. It's gonna be something, there's gonna be challenges we've never had to deal with, but this is CCL, that's what we, that's what we do and we will make this work. <clears throat> There'll be more details as this rolls out. So just please be patient. Planning a virtual conference is a little bit more complicated doing it the first time than doing the live conferences that we've been doing for years. Okay, last thing today. We had our Africa call this week, and that's with the African leaders. And who leads that call is Kathy Orlando, who is in charge of all of our chapters outside of the US. So there's now over 100 chapters outside of the US. And so uh, Kathy leads that along with David Michael Tawanga, who is our African group leader. And Kathy's from a family of scientists, her background's in science, her husband is a physician. And what was obvious on that call with our African leaders was that there was a lot of bad information in Africa about dealing with the virus. And so that the right thing to do on that call was to not talk about climate change, but what, what the right thing to do was to talk about how people could effectively deal with the virus and how it was important it was that people not get, get together. So I liked that Kathy pivoted and dealt with what she should be dealing with, I think. And then David Michael, towards the end of the call, said, you know, he never imagined that there would be an Easter where Africans weren't going to church. He just, he couldn't envision that. But he realized that the best thing he could do to serve people right now was to ask them to not go to church. And I think they have that right. You know, we're not going to be able to get to everybody we're only gonna be able to get to the people that we see, that we talk to, that we can reach. And I think if we ask the self, ourselves the question is, what will serve this one person or this group of people in front of me? We'll get the right answers. So I think that David had the right answer is the best way he could be of service of his fellow Africans was to ask them to not go to church. I think Kathy had the right answer in saying the best thing she could do on that call was to talk about COVID, not to talk about climate change. And I think at this particular moment, if our orientation could be, uh, what, how can I best serve this one person or this group of people? I think we'll get the kind of outcomes we're looking for. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. We'll see you on Earth Day on the 25th. We'll see you next month. We've invited a speaker whose expertise is on both dealing with the pandemic and climate at the same time. We hope that works out. And usually we're able to unmute everybody so you can say goodbye. We won't be able to do that on this line. But you can say goodbye in the chat. And those of us who are on will say goodbye, say goodbye over and over and over again. So bye, everybody. Thank you for being on. <laughs> bye. 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 Say it, Brett. Say it, Ricky. Thanks, say everyone. it, Ellie. Say it, Brian. Say it, Flannery. Bye. 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 Stay safe. Stay healthy. Keep washing those hands. <laughs> Keep washing those hands. That's right.